Hi, everybody, and welcome. So glad to be here. My name is Katie Hazard, and I have the great honor of being the Associate Director of Burning Man Arts and the head of the Burning Man Art Department. Um, what an amazing job, right? I am just so fortunate that I get to give so much of my energy to something that I love so much. And I'm really excited to be here with you together today to do episode two of Art Speaks. It's our second one ever. Um, and we hope to keep these going for, for quite a long time when we're really just getting started. So as folks are signing in, um, please say hi in the chat. Tell us where you're calling in from. Oh, wow, Luxembourg. Cool. <laughs> um, you know, we, we offer this at noon Pacific time with the hopes that lots of people from all over the world can join. So it's really cool to see, um, you know, now that we can't be together in person much anymore, it's fun to have this opportunity to, to come together from all over the world. Uh, so a couple tips for the Zoom webinar. Um, please feel free to use the chat as you already are as much as you want. Uh, sharing, you know, sharing your thoughts, cheering on the artists, um, whatever you'd like in the chat. If you have specific questions for the artists, you can see that there is a Q&A um, icon at the bottom of your screen there. So use that if you want to have particular questions because that's where we'll be checking to, to funnel those questions. So um, here we are at the second episode and I want to just say a little bit of like, well, what is this Art Speaks thing? Uh, for those of you especially who are tuning in for the first time, uh, this started as a series on Playa that our volunteer John Valentino along with Sarah Fisk hosted the last couple of years. And it was this much loved event that we did there with uh, artists giving talks. So we have transitioned it now to being a virtual experience. And at Burning Man, uh, especially with the art, but with everything really, we focus on and celebrate the process as much as the product. So it's not just the final artwork that people see on Playa, but all the months leading up to it, all the lessons that are learned and the communities that come together around that, the failures, the triumphs, all that good stuff. So. We wanted with the series to give you a little inside scoop to see what some of those background stories are leading up to the artwork that you will eventually see. So today's program, um, we're going to feature three artists. They are all grant funded honorary artists who are working on projects for the next time that we come together in Black Rock City. So as you know, we had to cancel Black Rock City in person this year. But that doesn't mean that we um, don't still have a lot of momentum. So we had already selected the honoraria artists before the pandemic hit. And so the plan is to still have them all bring their work the next time that we're able to have the event. Um, some of those artists are able to be planning now. Some are even able to safely be building now. And so a lot of them are happy to take advantage of this extra time. And lucky for us, we get a little sneak peek into what they're up to. So today's theme is sustainable art. So these three honorary artists that we have are all repurposing materials to create their amazing art. And before we meet these artists, I just want to briefly share some highlights of how Burning Man Project is prioritizing environmental sustainability. Last July, we published a 10-year sustainability roadmap. Uh, we can put the link to that in the chat, which has three goals of where we hope to get to as an organization by 2030. And those goals are first, to be carbon negative, second, to be regenerative, and third, to manage all of our waste sustainably. So there are lofty goals, but we're hoping we can achieve them by 2030. We've just hit one year into this 10-year plan and we've published a one-year progress report. So the link to that is also here in the chat. Um, so a couple specific projects we're working on towards environmental sustainability. We are prototyping a solar power solution for Black Rock City so that we can start to shift from fuel power to clean energy. We're conducting an emissions inventory at Black Rock City and we're starting a composting program. So also those of you who are really familiar with the Burning Man culture, we know that you guys can think of all kinds of things too. So we right now have this form open um, where we invite your ideas and participation to help make Burning Man more sustainable. So the link to that is also landing in the chat. Um, you know, being sustainable takes creativity and passion and determination, which is honestly a lot like what it takes to, to build this art. So we're excited to explore together today a few examples of how sustainability can be expressed through art. So the format for today, we're, we have three artists, like I said, each are going to share a short video, about five minutes. Um, the videos will have some fun behind the scenes stuff of their studios and such. 
And then the rest of our time together, we'll open it up to a live Q&A session. So you can put your questions in that Q&A box and then we'll do our best to get to as many of them as we can in the time that we have today. We're hoping to wrap up in an hour total. And lastly, a reminder that Burning Man is all about participation and there are no spectators. So as you listen to these artist stories, remember that you too can be involved. Everyone is welcome to bring art to Black Rock City. So without further ado, let's dive in. Uh, first up, we have this exceptional artist who also works in fashion design. So in his honor, uh, I'm going to put on my special kimono. <laughs> that is, um, here, let me get it on. It's made in India, and it's made all out of scraps and remnants from saris. So you can see all the different pieces that come together. Like this is one example that I could just find at my house of, of reclaimed materials. Uh, so we'll introduce and bring on next our first artist, Leroy Nu, who is coming to you live from Manila in the Philippines. Leroy is new to building art in Black Rock City, but has been creating large scale public sculptures and outlandish fashion design for over a decade. Um, he's originally trained as a sculptor, but has evolved to find opportunities for creative outlets through all kinds of other areas like production design and costuming and performance. Um, so welcome, Leroy. I'm so excited to have you with us together today. Oh, thank you for having me. Cool, welcome. So let's go ahead and, and get Leroy's video going. My name is Leroy Nyu and welcome to my studio. I'm gonna give you a quick tour. Let's go. So this is my little bodega, my little storage room where I keep prototypes, unfinished works, uh, some finished pieces or like pieces that haven't been collected yet. Uh, majority of the pieces that you see here are from my last show, which opened a few days before Manila went into lockdown. The title of the show was Dressing for the Edge of the World. A lot of the pieces are wearable. This in particular is made out of existing stainless steel kitchen utensils. So a lot of these materials I source from this huge uh, market district in Manila. It's a place called Divisoria. It's where the majority of the Filipinos go to get like surplus goods, craft objects, wedding souvenirs, clothes, fabric. And so this is an example of the wearable uh, Aliens of Vanilla helmets that I make. I create the interesting compound forms, piecing them together. And uh, a lot of the times, I try to make them as wearable as possible. So when lockdown was imposed all over Manila, we've been seeing a lot of news about how our local uh, frontliners were uh, in desperate need of uh, PPEs. With the leftover materials that we had from past projects, we decided to create improvised face shields, like this one, using acetate sheets and insulation foil and a piece of garter string. Here in front of you are samples of how these improvised face shields have evolved. We moved on to these statement face shields as a means to voice out our calls for the government to provide a more effective COVID response for our frontliners and our countrymen. This one, for example, is one of the earlier face shields, stylized face shields that we made using basically a four liter plastic bottle. The 275B here refers to the 275 billion pesos that our president uh, asked for along with emergency powers to be able to control the lockdown. And the question mark here is basically us asking where all this money went. The Junk Terror Bill is our call against the passing of the anti-terrorism bill, which is essentially an anti-dissent, anti-activist bill. Activism is not terrorism, still related to the anti-terrorism bill. So this one has Shoot Them Dead written over it. Uh, it's a quote from our president. 
uh, referring to what the military or the police should do if they see people like uh, going out of their homes and loitering in the streets during the lockdown. The past few weeks we've also used them during actual physical protests. Kind of works because their protective gear keeps you safe and provides a statement. initial model for the Mebuyan installation, which I proposed uh, to do for Burning Man, is essentially a large-scale architectural interactive installation. The title for this installation is Mebuyan. Mebuyan is a goddess from Filipino mythology, specifically the Bagobo mythology. She is a goddess of life and death, a goddess of the afterlife. She is represented as uh, this woman underground sitting on a wooden mortar with breasts covering her entire body. She is said to be nourishing the dead spirits of children in the afterlife so that they can grow up and continue on with their journey. The idea is each sphere represents a different kind of uh, world. People can access the spheres and these spheres are connected with bridgeways and some spheres are big enough to accommodate like a small group of people and some spheres are big enough to accommodate just one person. So you have very different experiences in terms of the lighting and textures and patterns. So the idea is each sphere will have its own uh, you know, uh, distinct physical quality from the rest, almost like a more compact solar system of unique planets. Most of the large-scale interactive installations that I do consider human activity, human interaction, and performance as a main component. This, I feel, is like one big performative playground. I work a lot with performance makers, uh, theater artists and dancers, and I have managed to apply my sculptural training to accommodate uh, the human body, movement, facial interaction. This Mebuyan vessel that I call it is kind of like a, a dream project of mine. I've always been fascinated with sci-fi imagery growing up, you know, coming from a small town in the Philippines before internet before uh, a lot of these technological innovations, I kind of look towards sci-fi films, comic books, uh, illustrated card games for inspiration and uh, references for form. And, you know, movie magic was such a big thing for me growing up. I've always been fascinated with this idea of creating sets and worlds, you know, completely out of, you know, magic and the most common materials transformed into this this believable illusion. I feel this uh, not very literal interpretation of the goddess Mabuyan is kind of my way of reinterpreting these different mythological stories that I've accumulated within me, all combined into this one structure. Wow, <laughs> that just blew my mind seeing all the stuff that you've been up to, Leroy. Like such imagination and like the colors and the textures and like, I just love getting to see that and, and knowing that it's happening all the way on the other side of the globe, learning about, you know, the folklore of another culture and the, this interpretation of a Filipino goddess, Mabuyan, like so cool. And also those face shields. Oh my gosh, I think if we had those here in the US, maybe more of us would start wearing them. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so um, next up, I want to introduce Emily Nicolosi, who is joining us live from Salt Lake City. And I first met Emily when she brought an art installation to Burning Man last year, uh, her first project there. And it was this gorgeous dichroic acrylic heart-shaped piece. And 
Um, I didn't know her or her work before that. And before the event where I decided when to, where to place all of the art, I had a good feeling about her and her work. And so I put it right up in the front of the man, right at six o'clock, like in a super prominent place. And she did not disappoint. Um, it turned out beautifully. I remember first meeting her in person on Playa. She gave me this, this beautiful necklace that kind of looks like the piece that she made. Um, so I'm glad to have gotten to know her more a little bit over the past year. And you are not going to believe what Emily and her team are able to do with something like this piece of normally discarded trash. So uh, welcome, Emily. So glad to have you here today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here um, and I hope you guys enjoy the video. Hi, my name is Emily Nicolosi and today I'm here to talk to you about our new art project, The Prism of Possibilities, which is an art project that focuses very much on the theme of sustainability. So in this short video, I'm gonna to talk to you about um, how we came up with the idea for this project, what it is, and a little bit about our build process. Um, so the idea for this project has kind of been a long time coming. So about uh, eight years ago now, um, I decided to give up my life as a ski bum, don't know why, <laughs> and go to grad school to study climate change. Um, when I was in grad school, I really tried to um, take classes in a lot of different disciplines, tried to learn everything I could, and um, wrote my dissertation about climate change mitigation from the grassroots. And you know, after all of that studying and researching, um, you know, I really came away believing that while, yeah, scientists can maybe um, you know, look at a gr an exponential growth curve of temperature going to the end of the century and start to kind of panic. Um, most people don't get emotional about graphs. <laughs> and, you know, so people, um, people really need to have like an actual like, memorable experience with something, a connection with something in order to really care about it. And so after building a smaller art project last year, I really wanted to do something about climate change this year and um, convinced my friends and we sat down and kind of honed in on this design and concept. Uh, so what is it? <laughs> the Prism of Possibilities is an exploration of multiple possible climate futures, depending on our actions um, to curb fossil fuel emissions. Uh, so there are three different climate scenarios built into the project, and these three scenarios are based on the work of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So the first is kind of a worst case, and also unfortunately business as usual scenario, um, where we're looking at about four degrees Celsius of warming at the end of the century, and some really devastating impacts. Um, the second is kind of a middle of the road scenario and the third is a best case scenario um, where we really get it together and very significantly reduce our emissions in the near future. Uh, so these um, these three different possibilities are connected through a prism um, and the prism is a zone which is just kind of like a swirling pointed dome um, and you know when you're skipping across the playa that's kind of the first thing that you'll notice um, we're hoping to make it look really cool to kind of lure you in uh, so the zone will have lots of shiny stuff but also kind of like the discarded forgotten about waste of humanity swirling around and when you walk in you'll notice these three different doors um, and each of these doors give you gives you access to a portal um, the portals are kind of like these swirling squares that are going around that gives the effect of a portal and at the end of each is one of the different climate scenarios which is represented by um, something that looks kind of like a house and it actually is the same house um, at the same time but in three different universes um, so when you come to the houses the first thing that you'll notice is 
is uh, the materials that it's made of and that will start giving you a clue to the story of what happened. You'll actually be able to go inside and explore some different clues, things like photographs, um, journals, just kind of everyday objects that will tell you the story of what happened. So a little bit about our build process. So uh, as I was saying, I'm a researcher by training, not an artist, and neither is anyone on our team. Uh, my partner Ian works in the lab, our buddy Steve is a web designer, and we have a ton of other people that come to help us that have various other kinds of jobs. Um, none of us has a background in architecture or sculpture or like anything relevant to making an art installation. Um, and so, you know, we're just trying to figure things out as we go. You know, we've learned a lot of stuff just from watching YouTube videos. We'll go to the local maker space. Um, we'll ask for help to learn how to use different types of tools. And I just wanted to say that um, to hopefully encourage people that you definitely can make some really cool art with just a little bit of elbow grease. You don't have to have any experience. For this project, we're trying to use upcycled materials as much as we can, which is definitely a challenge. Um, so last winter, we, when we were trying to figure it out, you know, we were collecting like tin cans and like plastic and lots of household waste. And I was kind of taking the plastic out onto the porch and like melting into these strands and trying to glue it together, making this like trash chandelier. <laughs> and it was like a total mess. Um, and you know, at this point, we've definitely uh, figured out some better materials and methods for working with upcycled stuff. Um, but it definitely, you know, it's not as easy as going to the store and just um, picking out exactly what you want. It can be done, but it takes some practice and some time. Um, so summing it up, I would say that thinking about art and sustainability is definitely a challenge. Um, there really are no easy solutions to the very complicated issues that the world is facing right now. Um, but I think at the same time, you know, um, art around sustainability issues and using upcycled materials in art really represents this amazing opportunity to give people something that they can touch and feel and experience and remember. Um, so that's it. Uh, looking forward to answering your questions. Wow, what an inspiring story. Um, it sounds like the world is lucky that you left your life as a ski bum. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the things I love most about the art in Black Rock City is that everyone is welcome. You don't have to be a professional artist. Like, it's so cool to see, Emily, how you and your whole team there are doing all kinds of other things and you're able to explore the concepts behind your climate change work in a whole different medium. So um, I'm sure you are, it sounds like you're learning a lot along the way and uh, we appreciate your sharing it with all of us. So thank you so much. And finally, um, last but certainly not least, I'm excited to introduce Thomas Dambo. Uh, this guy's work is just amazing. He's considered one of the world's leading recycle artists and he is famous for his various art installation around the world of trolls. Yes, trolls. Um, they've reached millions of people worldwide, and he is quite experienced in executing these large-scale projects, often in challenging environments, and he hopes to inspire people to think differently about their waste, showing that you can make beautiful art through trash. I first saw his work installed at the Morton Arboretum right outside Chicago, which is uh, my hometown, and there's a whole series of trolls there, and people love them. They're amazing. And this is a really beautiful arboretum that has featured other Burning Man artists before, like Hibi Kozo. Um, so Thomas is new to Black Rock City, but his work will fit right in there. You know, we love seeing reclaimed materials used there. Um, a huge project last year, the Folly, I bet a lot of you were able to see or, or would recognize, used almost entirely reclaimed wood. So. Um, it can be really stunning out there. So I'm so excited to have you with us together today, Thomas. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Katie. <clears throat> and hi, everybody. I'm with you from a little island in Denmark called Eholm, where me and a whole bunch of nice islanders have just finished my sculpt, my troll number 64. And I'm excited to show you a tour of my workshop.
Hello Burning Man, my name is Thomas Dambo, aka the Runaway Cowboy and I'm standing now here outside my big recycle workshop in Copenhagen, Denmark where I have promised to give you all a little tour, so follow me. So here is my hot outdoor little garden area and I decided to build the alphabet on wheels so you can rotate the alphabet around and write your own name. Um, and like everything that you will see in my tour, it is 100% made of trash that me and my lovely crew finds in the dumpsters of Copenhagen. My workshop is in here, but over here I have uh, all my uh, materials. Basically I have a little uh, hardware store of materials. So here I have people taking apart pallets and old floors and organizing it here. This here is some rope we scavenged that we are using for hair of a troll. Um, it came like black and black, black and yellow braided, but I only wanted it to have black hair. And then uh, like here, just materials, materials, materials. Um, it is wood that comes from um, from this comes from like a, a school, the carpenter school, and then they do like a little test for the exam. So mm -hmm. then there's 50 students, and all the 50 students does the same test. So that's a lot of pieces of wood, and then I get it to my workshop and. Here we have plastic, and here we have more wood, and here we have bicycles, and here we have a sauna, and it's all recycled um, and ready to swim in and become a troll or some project when it swims into my workshop later. Okay, and then here I have uh, more materials, so every time somebody, they take a kitchen countertop and get a new one, they throw it out and I get the old one, so I save that for like a little bit more nice things. Uh, this is uh, some boards, I got 10 pallets of this uh, iron wood, they call it, get some really nice wood. Uh, so that was an was, uh, old harbor front in Copenhagen and then this was the leftovers and I got it all. And you can see here, it's just materials, materials, materials. Here we have a, a face of the throne. I was now here in 2020 commissioned to build 25 sculptures all around the world. And when I was half finished with the first one in uh, San Juan in Puerto Rico, uh, Corona came and yeah, shut down everything. So basically 100% of my uh, income for the rest of the year. I have eight full-time employees here in my workshop. So 100% of the economy uh, just vanished. And then I was uh, stuck here and like pretty uh, annoyed with the whole situation and thinking what can I do now? I have all the faces and all the parts for all these sculptures I'm supposed to do. So then instead we ch change focus and now we're doing a treasure hunt where we build uh, 12 sculptures all around uh, Denmark and then I write a fairy tale around it that combines it all and then through a website side we build that's called trollmap.com you can then go and find the different uh, sculptures because I want people to go out and explore their neighborhood because um, often you don't really know what is just around the corner even though you live there. So my sculptures help people and motivates them to go and um, to go on an adventure in the little forest or on the beach or something because all my sculptures are hidden um, I like to hide them in, in different places and we make them all of recycled materials because I want the people of the world to uh, remember that trash can be a beautiful thing and I want them to uh, remember to take care of nature and I think that we will only take care of nature if we actually go out in nature because so many of us are stuck in the cities inside our our screens. So um, those are the two core principles of my art. So all this for example is plywood boxes from a retail store and then we get the plywood boxes they use them for as tables in the store, and then we get the boxes, take them apart, and then they become the faces of the trolls. And in here is my, my workshop. Well, there's another troll face, and my buddy Hexa is working on um, another project we're doing down there. And um, yeah, this is the we're making the t-shirts. With the Trollefalke Fest, it means the Troll Folk Fest, um, which is what I call my 12-piece treasure hunt around in Denmark that culminates with after we build the 12, 12 trolls and written 12 chapters of the story, then we will throw like a party where my friends who, who plays a polka, they will play, play a polka concert and then you can uh, do a workshop where you can build a troll tale and be painted like a troll and do troll ears and hear the fairy tale and 
all stuff like that. And then the plan is that then everybody, they drive from the Trolle Folkefest um, celebration when everything is done on their bikes and cargo bikes filled with, uh, with plants and trees. And then we drive out into a, a deserted area uh, where there's just a grass lawn. And then I'm going to build a troll there, and then the whole parade will then plant the forest on that uh, place. So that, well, that is my vision. But normally, I always get my way. <clears throat> and then uh, here are small faces. These faces here um, were supposed to go to the United States. Um, and there are supposed to be five siblings that are playing hide and seek in the forest. That's why this one is holding its. Uh, it's eyes nice because then um, while the other ones are hiding and then um, you can then yourself go and help find the trolls that are hidden in the, in the forest. And then um, these trolls here, they are a part of a 10 siblings project where we do 10 troll siblings. Um, and um, oh, I hope I will do it um, to come back to uh, beautiful Bernheim where I built a troll last year that has, uh, is pregnant. So now the, the chapter two, when I come back, uh, my idea is that the troll then um, gives birth uh, to 10 siblings. Um, and the day it, do it does it is on a black moon. So the next morning when the troll wake up, all the siblings are, have run away and are all like uh, scattered all over the forest. And then you have to, uh, to go and find them yourself. And um, that is the tour of the workshop. And just to conclude it, I wanted to, um, tell a little bit about the project I was scheduled to do at Burning Man 2020 that hopefully will happen next year. Uh, I call it for the lost troll and the troll is a troll that is sitting like this. Oh no, it was like this actually. It's sitting like this and then there's a staircase that goes up here so you can come up and stand in this height and this would be something like uh, 20 25 feet off the ground and then you can stand here so that would make a human about this this tall and then the troll is sitting and looking at you um, like um, like a human studying a butterfly on its finger then instead a troll studying a human in its hands um, yeah but I really hope I get to do it uh, in 2021 or in 2022 or whenever we are all gonna be able to go back to school so See you and have a nice time. Oh my gosh, what a treat to get to see what it's like in your studio and hear you describe all the adventures that your trolls have inspired. Um, I love that you have a sauna. Also, I can kind of imagine that probably everyone in Copenhagen knows you and when they have extra stuff, they call you up. Um, and man, I wish every town could have a troll treasure hunt and a polka party. You know, we could all um, wear some masks from Leroy and come do your polka party and get together safely. <laughs> sounds like a good time. <laughs> it sounds like a deal. <laughs> cool. I'll okay. be happy to go and see all the towns and build all the trolls with all of you guys. Yes. <laughs> and I'm sure there's enough trash to come around all over the world, sadly. We could use more fun like that everywhere, I think. Um, so now we've had our chance to tour with each of these three artists. We're going to open it up to our Q&A time with everybody. So I want to invite um, Emily and Leroy and Thomas all to come back um, on the screen with me and we will dive into some, um, some Q&A time. So folks, um, I know some of you have put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom. Uh, if you have more, feel free to add them in there and we will get to as many as we can. So uh, let's see, first for you, Leroy, I have a, a practical question from um, Justin. He wants to know, what tools do you use to fuse the recycled plastic bottles? Uh, I actually just uh, quickly answered that one. Um, I start with making holes using a, you know, uh, an assortment of punchers. Uh, so there's actually quite a wide uh, variety of punchers that you can use. And uh, sometimes if there are hard to reach areas where areas where uh, the punchers can't reach, I use uh, soldering iron to just melt holes. And then I connect the different pieces of plastic with uh, mostly cable ties, uh, colored cable ties. Um, they're quite efficient and uh, clean to look at, you know. Um, but sometimes I end up using nylon, uh, nylon strings to tie them together. And, um, 
sometimes staplers. <laughs> it's pretty pretty straightforward, actually. Cool. Thank you. Great. Uh, Emily, I have a question for you. Um, how does your scientific training and background make you a better artist? You know, how do you think it might help you or be to your advantage in the process of building and installing art to have the background that you have? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I would say for the most part, um, you know, being a researcher has really trained me to plan ahead very far. Um, so like usually the projects that I'm working on are minimally six months long, but sometimes a year or several years long. And so um, that has gotten me uh, to the point where I'm always planning really far ahead. And I, I think, you know, building a big project for Burning Man, you definitely need those skills of planning. So like having this vision of what you want this thing to look like in the end, and then like making a lot of lists and figuring out how to break, break it down to where you know what you need to work on like today. Um, I think that's really the main way actually. Cool, yeah, I could see that being a lot of help. Cause I know people think that it's just so much about the skills of actually building a piece, but there's so much, you know, volunteer management and, and financial management and fundraising and project management and all that stuff. So it's cool you're already coming to it with a bunch of those skills. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, you know, I see Emily, one other question for you. Uh, can you explain to us the difference between upcycled and recycled? Um, sure, I can try. Um, let's see, I believe the difference would be so with recycling, um, you know, you're taking your plastic bottles and your tin cans and putting them in your recycling bin and letting the municipal municipality you live in deal with it. Um, now with upcycling, the difference would be that you're taking that stuff, taking those plastic bottles like Leroy was doing with the mess and making it into something else that you're using now. Um, my understanding is that at the recycling plant, they're like melting things down and trying to reprocess it so they can make another kind of new thing that just has recycled stuff in it. So that would be the difference, if that makes sense. That sounds right to me, yeah. And it sounds like the recycle process takes a lot of extra energy, like the transporting it to the facility and the energy to melt it and whatever. So, so finding other ways to use those materials seems like the way to go if we can. Yeah. <laughs> cool. yeah. <laughs> um, Thomas, a question for you. Uh, why trolls? Can you tell us what inspired that particular archetype? Well, I would love to. It's a, often, uh, it's a question I often get. And um, I think it is uh, the things that I love the most uh, combined. So it's my love for diving into other people's trash, getting my hands dirty and see what I can find. And it's my love for uh, Scandinavian folklore and fairy tales. And it's my love for going like exploring, like whether it's urban exploring or just exploring in nature. And then it's my love for building things and creating big things and writing stories. Um, so it's all those things combined into the perfect job for myself. And I'm so lucky. So the perfect job for me makes a lot of people happy and educates a lot of people about recycling. So it's going to be hard to quit the job. <laughs> Good. Yeah, don't retire anytime soon, please. <laughs> oh, someone's just saying in the chat that it's been such a joy having the trolls at the Arboretum near Chicago that um, they've seen them many times and um, taken a lot of their friends to see them and they're still in really good shape. So that's cool. Um, another question for you, Thomas. Um, can you get more specific about where the materials for the trolls are sourced from? Is it from a waste management facility or a transfer station? Like, How do you find the materials you actually want? So actually, like one of the, the like the, the ways into building these big sculptures was that I like at, at the point like six years ago before I started building the aesthetic of the troll sculpture, I, I knew that I wanted to build sculptures in a big scale of a material that I could find all over the world. And I just needed to have the aesthetic to fit for that. Um, and by that material, I mean like unpainted uh, smaller pieces of, uh, of wood. Um, so it's um, and then because I knew that I can get all the volunteers that I want because people love to be a part of something that's positive and big and crazy and, and, and I love to do it. So, so if I knew that if I could find um, an aesthetic for a big sculpture like that, that I could find all over the world, then I could build as many as a big sculptures that um, I wanted to do. Um, so um, the answer is that I find them all over the place where we go. Um, so normally we like um, sometimes we we will just take a 
like a bicycle and then just bike around in the area because the easiest is to to get your materials as close to where you need them as possible and um, and often like this is a if i have like a project coordinator that helps me for example in the modern arboretum or something like this wonderful people but then they will uh, they don't see it as i see it so they will like maybe drive to the other end of chicago to get the material whereas the the way i do it is like oh we are at the liquor store buying uh, beers <laughs> there's some wood there let's bring it back we're here in the car you know um so often like that but of course also People will show up at my workshop with, with materials. People will will call me. Do you want my old floor? Like um, whatever people have or companies or something. Because I think everybody they like to see their their old things and their trash get new life. Because we spend uh, some time and some energy of our own life uh, buying those things. So it feels good to give them and pass them on. So I think that's uh, what we should teach the world how to do. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I like what you said, something about positivity and, and largeness and joy and something like that. I was like, oh, that sounds a lot like Burning Man. You know, like I think it, um, it's the same thing where, you know, helping teach the world of another way to, to be. So that's cool. Thank you. Um, somebody wants to know, actually, if you're going to plan on burning the troll that you're building to, to bring to Burning Man. No, I wouldn't. I, it would go against my principles. So I would never do that. Good. I'm glad. Yeah, we do tend to burn something around a little under 10% of the artworks at Burning Man. There are over 400 there every year. So there are fewer than some people think um, that actually burn, but it's preferable if the burn is related to the piece in some way. And obviously you wouldn't want to burn a troll, you know, <laughs> like the poor troll is kind of like, oh, you don't want to burn it. Yeah. It feels like a creature. You wouldn't want to do that. So thanks. Um, let's see what other questions do we have here? Um, Emily, somebody wants to know, uh, someone named Peaches asked, how can we support you and your project from afar or in person? Um, yes, um, there are a lot of ways. Um, we're always looking for people to help. Um, so yeah, if you're in the Salt Lake City, Park City region, you could come volunteer, but also we're looking for people to help us on Playa um, with the build. We're gonna need a lot of help because um, we have these Four different structures and they're kind of complicated builds so um, I can drop my email in if um, that person or anybody else wants to volunteer on Playa with a build or tear down. Um, you know also we uh, will be doing some crowdfunding and things like that so there are those kinds of ways of supporting as well from afar. Cool thank you that's great. Yeah, that's one of the neat things about the art at Burning Man too, is that it's all, almost all of it is built in community. You know, you'll, you'll have a, a lead artist, but um, so many people are part of making it happen. So that's great. You have opportunities for people to join. Yeah, we have a ton of people that come to help. Um, you know, a lot of our friends, people uh, last year just came up to us on Playa and started helping us with our builds. So yeah, we're always, always looking for people, as I'm sure are a lot of the artists too. <laughs> Um, cool. I have another question that's coming in from Leroy or for Leroy. Um, how did you start fusing your art and your politics? Was there some specific impetus that, that brought those two things together? And can you talk a little bit more about ways that you use your art to amplify your voice? Um, I guess it started way back as uh, art students. Uh, we were always considering the role of artists uh, in and art making in the Philippines where you know we barely get any support from the government and you know it's really hard to make a living so the choice to do like public works was kind of a response to this um, uh, I guess Filipinos culturally don't go to museums and art galleries to enlighten themselves it's uh, it's kind of like a relatively foreign idea to us uh, because uh, I guess we have this uh, um, pre-colonial uh, uh, belief that uh, all our creative undertakings are integrated into our daily rituals. So yeah, um, I, that's that's the reason why I tried to maximize my uh, my reach to try to like create a an up, uh, alternative to the art experience by uh, meeting my audience halfway by collaborating with performers by. Uh, doing uh, uh, public art interventions uh, in in random public sites, and uh, and from then on, it was just uh, hard not to you know um, deal with uh, uh, 
the pressing issues of the day, you know, after that, you know, it just seemed natural to, to us to just respond organically. Even the use of found objects and repurposed materials was also part of this, uh, this, these uh, ways that we can contribute and um, tackle the, uh, these, uh, these pressing issues. And um, well, now we uh, in the Philippines, especially under uh, during this pandemic, uh, the political climate is you know a bit distressing and grave, and a lot of you know I mean as is with the rest of the world, there are a lot of things that are kind of you know um, unbalanced right now, and and it's uh, it's really a simple choice to use our creative platforms to to voice out the call of the people, especially now, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. I mean, I feel like art really is such a way to get um, messaging across, regardless of what mm -hmm. kind of where the messaging's coming from. And so um, it's fun to see, I mean, your video was just phenomenal, like all the, the colors and the textures and everything you use, but to have it be a, a joyful way to be getting that mm -hmm. message across, I just love how it's, um, yeah, we love our colors. We love our fiestas. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a typical Filipino thing to like the all the brightness and the, the color? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, the, even the idea of repurposing these, uh, these uh, discards that we have and transforming them into Christmas decoration. You know, Filipinos are obsessed with Christmas. They start decorating their homes at the start of September. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know? oh, I didn't so, know that. So you'll see like these colorful plastic bottles transformed into Christmas lanterns. Uh, and they've become, they become like a source of livelihood for these people who collect bottles. Uh, if they don't actually uh, surrender them to like recycling centers, they actually make, uh, try to find some other use for them. Hmm. So I'm really just tapping into this, this, um, this tendency this, uh, for us mm -hmm. to not throw things away. Mm -hmm. you know and you know repurpose these materials mm -hmm. cool it's it's neat to know just like just to get this little window of like what's going on in manila right now and to hear from somebody there it's like, crazy here <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's kind of crazy everywhere in the world right now yeah tell me about it oh um let's see uh thomas i have another question for you somebody asked yep. Can you speak to how Danish troll folklore might compare to Norwegian troll folk, folk tales? <laughs> that to me is like, I don't even know, I didn't even know there were Norwegian troll folk tales, but um, somebody does. <laughs> I think it's pretty much exactly the same. Uh, uh, like it's Norwegian and Sweden and Denmark and Finland is all like a part of what we call Scandinavia. And most of these countries have actually been like a little bit of the same country. Then everything was Norway, then everything was Sweden. Vikings came and, and took over all the land. And then the Danish Vikings took all over the land. And like, so it's been the same um, religion or ex explanation of uh, how things worked. So the trolls would be, be like, <clears throat> they, like if the humans behave bad, maybe they would teach, 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 teach them. Or if they were really nice, then uh, the trolls would be good to the people. So it's a, it's a lot of the same uh, the stories and, and legends that, uh, that are in the Danish and the, the Norwegian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fun seeing these like modern interpretations of some kind of mythology or folktale um, that I see both in your work and Leroy's too, and with Mabuyan having some uh, folklore and how it lives out in us in this moment is neat. Um, someone else I think, it's just funny. I think it's just nice to <clears throat> to write like so what I do but my stories is that I write modern day folklore stories so I try to talk about true like a fairy tale about like so in my fairy tale the humans are called for the little people and then the trolls they're like talking about why the little people they do like this and they don't understand it and it just puts uh, our actions into perspective if you see it through like a, an animal or a troll oh that's cool yeah, that's great. Like we certainly are not the most important ones here, even though we like to think we are sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like too, when you're thinking like, oh, well, there's this whole planet. We're so small in this whole universe. Like, you know, when you get that different perspective, it helps you to, um, yeah, just, just see things differently. That's cool. Um, someone's asking also, Thomas, about the trolls. What percentage of them get built in the moment on site versus assembled totally ahead of time in your studio? So pretty much 100% like this, of the 64 that I've done, there's only one where we've built the majority of it in my workshop. 
Otherwise, I like to build it into the environment where I come and out of the local source material and out of it, the local like volunteers and the local people I meet. So like on this island where we are right, building one right now, I think we've had something like <clears throat> we brought a face for my workshop and then we met a local guy who has like um, he's experimenting with doing like a pressure treated with bio like a, a sustainable pressure treated uh, wood. So from his uh, factory, then we got a lot of wood from him and then his wife had been cooking food, food for us and they took a vacation to come to the island and to be with us. And then like the local children have helped us collect rocks for a necklace for the troll. And so it's like, yeah, I like to, to be in the moment with the material and I, and I don't like to plan too much, uh, like maybe a little bit of opposite process of what uh, Emily has. I would love to be able to do that and plan a lot ahead, but um, you don't never know what you're going to find in a container. So I can't uh, like really plan that I want to find 500 uh, of the same length wood boards. I have to like, uh, like, so I've been like, if my long education is in trusting that I will find what I need and that it will all be okay. And um, yeah, so that, that's how I, uh, how I swim through it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good lesson for all of us right now, too, trusting that things will all be okay no matter what, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty. So that's, that's good for all of us to learn. Um, and now I have a question or two for all of you or any of you that feel like you'd like to answer. Um, what materials are hard to source from waste? Like what things do you find that you actually need to buy? Fragile things. What, what kind of things? Fragile things, things oh, fragile, that break yeah. if you throw them into a container, they uh, are often really, really hard to find. Mm -hmm. and, and in my case, screws. Uh -huh. Yeah, yes, same. Uh, I think those, like the connecting components, um, like for myself, I would need, you know, like new cable ties or like um, uh, string to tie these materials together. Um, but, you know, everything else, uh, I try to uh, make sure that it's either repurposed or pre-used or, you know, uh, discards for this specific series of face masks that I've made recently. But, yeah. And paint. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. yeah, if, true. <laughs> if, if ever I do need to paint my pieces, uh, but sometimes I do like keeping the original finish of the material. But on the occasions that I would need paint, that's, uh, that's something that I would need to get, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I also think that, um, oh, you can talk, Emily. No, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so like uh, if somebody is wondering how to, uh, to get materials, then my uh, advice is always try and, and think about who would create that trash and who would create it in abundance. So if, for example, let's say that you would like to have a lot of leather from footballs, then either contact a football factory or contact like a, a stadium where they would have a lot of footballs. If you would want to have a lot of uh, uh, food, then uh, contact a, a restaurant that has a buffet where they every evening bring throw it out and just be a little bit creative with it because pretty much everything in the world is throwing out in abundance every day. So you just need to find the source. That's good advice. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say some of the same things like screws, nuts, bolts, anything that's maybe bearing a lot of weight. Um, so like for our main structure, it's pretty big. So we are going to use uh, new steel, unfortunately, but that's the only piece that we're doing. And like, we don't want someone to um, cause the structure to collapse. So. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. I remember like that with the folly last year too. The structural members were all new because that's, you know, that's not something that you want to take a risk with. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, let's see. I think we have time for just one more question and I'm looking to see what we still have left that we haven't answered. Um, somebody has a question, a general question for all of you of um, what inspired you to showcase your upcycled creations? Like, did you start building them and then you started showing them or, or were you writing showing, showing art and then you started using recycled materials? Uh, and tied in with that question is how would you suggest an unrecognized artist um, start to be like you and, and get recognized for working with their upcycled art. That's kind of a double E question. So really any of you could answer either part of it that you'd like. 
<laughs> but for um, me, like the way I okay, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Like what I like, uh, my advice would be to like, uh, if you uh, if you have something, then like invest it all back into you. So if you get an opportunity to to exhibit on your school or at your local fair or something, then like like if you get like a thousand dollars for the budget, then don't take that thousand dollars and then try to make it into like your salary to invest all those thousands plus another five hundred and then like blow the proportions the hell out of your project and the because that's it that's how you learn and then like you have to invest it back into yourself that's how i, I like i think that has been my success personally cool um well in, in my case i guess it was more it started out as something very practical um you know as you know as as art students you know you're always trying to look for the cheapest materials ever or or uh free if possible and um uh and it just so happens that uh, we get a lot of these, uh, there's a lot of plastics, <laughs> uh, mass produced plastics. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a very good thing, but uh, most uh, lower class uh, households would, you know, would uh, possess mostly plastic versions of domestic products. And these are the kind of, kinds of objects that, you know, we would get to collect a lot of, you know, in terms of quantity. And yeah, and, and as long as you have the quantity, you actually have the means to like perfect somehow or like uh, master the technique of putting these things together. Uh, like the plastic bottles, you know, the series of plastic bottle face shields, for example, I just was uh, preparing for a large scale installation before the lockdown happened. So I had uh, stuck with me in the studio piles and piles of collected these plastic bottles. So, you know, lucky enough, uh, people were sending me these images of, of uh, protesters or like frontliners uh, using improvised uh, PPEs using uh, plastic gallon bottles and saying that it reminded them of my work. And, you know, that, and that just, you know, gave me the idea to, you know, actually transform what I had in my studio into these statement face shields. So it's really just, you know, making the most out of what's available and out of the situation. Um, yeah. That's great. And now you don't have all those bottles sitting around in your studio. <laughs> People are actually using <laughs> yeah. them. Cool. I'm yeah. on the hunt for new ones now. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I was gonna just echo what Leroy said. Um, obviously, I'm much more of a beginner than these guys, but, um, and this is the first project that we're using upcycled materials. The project we made last year was not upcycled um, and kind of inspired me to want to do it upcycled because I was looking at all the materials we're using and feeling pretty bad about it. Um, I would say that like with anything, like I was talking about in the video, making this like trash chandelier, I mean, it's you gotta have kind of like a beginner's mind like you don't know what you're doing so you kind of play around with things and like experiment and prototype and like you might be like god i'm going crazy right now but if it's something you've never worked with before you know it's not going to come out great the first time you just kind of have to practice and play around with it until you find something that looks cool i love that it's so i really like that story of it being last year not using recycled materials and then being like oh wow this really isn't the way to go like that's a, an immediate lesson and that you're applying it like the next time right away that you can that you're going to come back and, and do it in a different way like that's super inspirational <laughs> well i'm i'm keeping an eye on the time and i'm realizing that i'm sorry that we're going to have to wrap up now um but it's been such a treat to spend this time together with all of you and I just really especially want to thank the three of you, Leroy and Emily and Thomas. Um, you're among the first artists to appear on this series that we're doing. Um, you're calling in from crazy time zones, Leroy. I think it's it's three <laughs> in the morning in Manila. I'm half awake. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for sharing your time and your talents with us. Um, I also want to thank my colleagues at Burning Man and the artists and the whole Burning Man community all the people who really hold sustainability near and dear to their heart. There are a lot of people that are, are working tirelessly to, to take better care of our planet and Mother Earth, and I'm really grateful for that. And um, to all of you who called in today or who are watching this later at home, a huge sincere thank you for attending, for supporting these artists, and for whatever ways you find within your sphere of influence to focus on sustainability. 
if you have thoughts about today's program, you can reach us at artspeaks at burningman.org. And there is more art coming in your future. We have the next episode of Art Speaks coming up on Wednesday, August 12th at noon Pacific again. The theme of that episode will be Playa Magic. So we'll hear stories from, um, I don't know, maybe a dozen or so artists who had exceptionally serendipitous moments while building art in Black Rock City. So register for that on Kindling again. Um, some updates about the 2020 Temple at Burning Man. We just did a live conversation with those artists on Monday. Um, the recording for that is, is going to go in the chat there. It's on the Burning Man YouTube channel. And we have another workshop coming up with the 2020 Temple artists on Monday, August 10th to learn how you can make a virtual offering this year. One other thing I wanted to share with you, there's a really cool program we have going on called the Land Art Generator Initiative. It's a program happening at Fly Ranch. Um, so we've partnered with the Land Art Generator Initiative and Burning Man to do this multidisciplinary design challenge. Um, Fly Ranch is a 3,800 acre piece of property just north of where we hold Burning Man. It's got amazing natural landscape of hot springs and geysers and all kinds of flora and fauna. And so we are opening this um, event where you can propose regenerative art that will be placed in this really beautiful landscape. So the deadline for that um, grant proposal is October 31st, and we'll put a link to that in the chat, or you can search LAGI, L-A-G-I. And lastly, I wanted to um, invite you to think about making a donation. I know you already all give in many different ways to this community. If you feel inspired to give further, um, you can give directly towards our sustainability efforts by supporting my good friend and colleague, DA, who just did this walk, an 85 mile walk um, to the place where we hold the Burning Man event to raise money for our sustainability efforts. So um, he's raised about $30,000 so far, which is awesome. So the link to that is in the chat. And the work that our team does year round to support the artists we had today and, and all artists around the world really is part of the larger mission of the Burning Man Project, which is a nonprofit. So if you feel moved to support us, we appreciate that as well. Um, so we would love it if you could help us continue our work and sustainably bring back Black Rock City in all of its glory. So for that, you can um, reach us at donate.burningman.org. And I just wanted to end with a big thanks again to you for joining. Um, keep thinking of ways that you can refuse, reduce, reuse, repurpose, recycle. And that's all. Have a great day. See you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care, y'all. Take care.